People are going to lose their minds. This is a moment in history unlike anything humanity's gone through. It's a very different world for humans to come. Take a step back and see the broad picture, which is the way all these technologies are interlinked. Because this is all about exponentiality, and humans can't think in exponential terms. How consequential do you want to say machine intelligence is? It's almost certainly as consequential as writing. How long did writing take to disseminate through the human population? You know, hundreds, thousands of years. And we're dealing with it now on a scale of months. But in this kind of world, you're compounding 100% growth every year, and the numbers become astronomical. AI is going to spot patterns in the world that were just completely invisible to us. Even if you think that the AI and the robots are your demise, you might as well bloody invest in them and make some money out of it. If not, you're just gonna be angry man shaking your fists at the clouds. What are the realities of a recession? Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Monday, November 6th, 2023. I'm Ash Bennington. I'm joined today by Danielle Lacal, Chief Economist at Tresses. Daniel, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Ash. It's a great pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. A quick note for our Real Vision members. We've rolled on our, our new Real Vision 2.0 platform. You can join it at realvision.com forward slash new. That's realvision.com forward slash new. So check your email to get on the new platform. There's some amazing new features that I'm sure we're going to want to check out. Daniel, we were talking just before the show, obviously a very eventful time in markets right now, a lot of conversations happening, a lot of price action. 50,000 foot, big picture, Daniel, where do you see us right now? Well, I think that the big picture would tell us that where we are right now is in what I call the hangover of the stimulus packages. We are not seeing a headline recession. GDP is not reflecting a recession fundamentally because it's bloated by debt. We have an enormous level of accumulation of, of debt in government spending, which obviously supports GDP, but also in consumer spending. We have an unprecedented level of credit card debt that is uh, making the headline figure of consumer spending relatively stable. All of those uh, indicate that uh, things may get significantly worse as the reality of rate hikes and also the tailwind of the stimulus plans stop working. I think that those, those things, um, you know, when we see rate hikes start to creep in re the real economy, we start to see, we're already seeing delinquencies rising, no? But I think that we have not yet seen the true extent of the normalization of policy because rate hikes are one side of the coin. But the other important side of the coin is monetary contraction, is the amount of money in the system being reduced. No, So I think that those elements need to be taken into account and those should be playing out in the uh, beginning of 2024 which also coincides with an important wall of maturities in uh, investment-grade debt, also in high-yield debt. Yeah, Daniel, such an important point. I read your research note. You point this out. Obviously, Q3 2023 GDP coming in at a beat 4.9% seasonalized annualized rate of growth. Uh, this in stark contrast to some of the gloom and doom we're hearing. You point this connection out to debt. What's the precise mechanism for both the hangover from ultra low rates plus the fiscal stimulus that we saw during the pandemic period. What's the transmission mechanism? How does that work? How long does it take to unwind? Um, uh, I think that obviously the first element that we need to take into account is that um, the lag effect that we're all talking about, for example, of rate hikes, exists also in stimulus packages. No? So you cannot expect the uh, stimulus plans of 2021 and 2022 to not continue to generate some level of tailwind in 2023. But we also must remember that this is the first time, at least in recent history, in which the monetary policy and fiscal policy are going the opposite ways. 
monetary policy is contractive. The uh, Federal Reserve is hiking rates and reducing the amount of money. It's unwinding the balance sheet uh, slower than I anticipated, but it's doing it. While the government is not paying any attention, the government is uh, continuing to deficit spend like there's no tomorrow. And obviously, that also creates some level of what I call uh, unproductive GDP that this, that disguises the weakness, for example, that is pretty evident in investment and is pretty evident in uh, in the export uh, of the economy. No. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about asset prices specifically here, because it's been a quite unusual year. As we sit here in November, I just want to read these statistics out. S&P 500, which closed the day uh, weekly positive, about flat, I think up about two-tenths of 1% on a daily basis. S&P 500 year-to-date right now, just over 14%. Equal weighted S&P 500 is negative on a year-to-date basis, off about, uh, call it about half a percent. And if we want the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, NASDAQ 100 up on a yearly basis, nearly 40% year to date, I should say, year to date up nearly 40%. This speaks to a great deal of concentration in what's happening in US equity markets. How does the thesis that you have uh, in terms of the stimulus debt thesis translate into what we see happening in US equity markets? I think it's it's pretty evident that it uh, that what we're seeing is actually the transmission mechanism of monetary policy working beautifully. You have an earnings recession in 493 stocks. You have a completely evident uh, situation of markets reacting the way that they should to profits that are below estimates, particularly when companies are uh, missing both on sales and on EPS. So the market is reacting as there is a real earnings recession in 493 of the stocks. And there are seven mm, that basically make this uh, uh, sort of disguised picture of what the index is 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 showing, no, and what the index is, and and why do these technology giants perform significantly better than the rest? Because they're the most immune to rate hikes. Certainly, the ones that benefit the most of a policy that, although the Fed would consider is uh, hawkish, is continuing to be accommodative. And we saw it, for example, in the uh, banking crisis, how immediately the Fed increased its balance sheet. And we see it today by looking at how much the balance sheet has been reduced, which is, we are already in November, and it's half of what we all estimated at the beginning of the year. So it's normal that the highest risk longest duration assets in equity, which are technology giants, uh, perform better. And it's also normal that high yield bonds are actually doing significantly better than sovereign bonds. So I think that what the market is actually screaming is, okay, we have tightening and we have an earnings recession. We might get a macroeconomic recession in 2024. And the way to protect yourself is not through sovereign bonds, because it's not going to be supported monetary policy anymore. It's going to be in those uh, equities that uh, remain, let's say, mm, almost immune to the economic cycle because of their uh, advantages in the technology sector. Yeah, Dan, when you, when you say everything is working exactly as it should be based on the thesis, it reminds me of one of my grandfather's favorite expressions. The operation was a success. Unfortunately, the patient still died. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. We, we hear a lot these, uh, the concept of soft landing from the Fed. No? Uh, the Fed is engineering a soft landing, and it's going to, and this is very good. People don't understand what a soft landing is because they focus on the word soft. Hmm? Obviously, they're not going to call it a hard landing. Huh? They don't understand the word landing. And the word landing means recession. They need a recession to bring down the quantity of money that has been bloated in 2020 to 2021. Because rate hikes 
reduce the growth of the quantity of money. But the global money supply, if you look at the proxies, has, has barely been reduced from 108 trillion to 104 trillion, which is almost nothing. If you think about the global money supply, isn't it? No. So uh, I think that what we are seeing is simply that the, L, the, 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 the concept of soft landing is based on the idea that uh, you can unwind the excesses of monetary policy of 2020, 2021 uh, without breaking anything in the economy. And that is impossible. The, 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 the myth of the soft landing, uh, we also saw it in 2007. If you Google the most looked, up, uh, looked word in 2007, it was also soft landing. Central banks and, uh, and uh, governments were also talking about a soft landing. Of course, things are different today than in 2007. But they're not massively different in the essence of a soft landing, which is that you need a correction in the quantity of money, and that can only come from a lower pricing of the assets in the balance sheets of banks, as well as a lower pricing in uh, overall uh, assets globally. So uh, that is, unfortunately for people that think it's a, a different thing, is, is a recession. They, and if we don't get a recession, then we get persistent inflation, and then obviously, and, and this is basically what I think the market is starting to tell us, is that if it, it's, it's either a recession or a much worse uh, period of prolonged inflation that's closer to stagflation. So if it's between recession and stagflation, what we need to bet, the place where you don't want to be in is in sovereign bonds. And certainly not in those industrials, materials, or consumer discretionary stocks that are the ones that are provided in the case of Europe, for example, uh, almost 70% uh, of the profit warnings. And there's been 37 so far since the 1st of September uh, come from those three sectors. Daniel, let me ask, sober wor sobering words there, I should say. Let me ask you two questions at once uh, here because they're interrelated. First, what does that portend for the future outlook for U.S. equities, indeed European equities as well, uh, in terms of the concentration that we've seen in terms of those seven stocks that we've just mentioned? What does that portend going forward? Uh, and second, one of the narratives that we've heard or themes that we've heard is this notion that when you have uh, the, the yield on uh, longer dated treasuries rising, price deteriorating, that there's some element of a uh, Fed not needing to act because the bond market is tightening financial conditions for them. Talk a little bit about what that means and what the risks are there. Um, they're absolutely right. Uh, when the tightening is happening in the credit market and, the, and banks are limiting the supply of credit to the economy, what basically ends up happening is what we are seeing right now, which is that the, the entire burden, in fact, of the normalization of monetary policy is falling on the shoulders of families and businesses, on the private sector, on the productive sector. The, uh, the sovereign bond market continues to function adequately. Therefore, the Fed is not concerned because mm, deficits are refinanced at a higher price, yes, but they're refinanced, no problem. And the uh, and governments continue to deficit spend without a problem. So on the one hand, what you get is crowding out. The government continues to uh, finance its deficit without any significant problem. And uh, that reduces the amount of credit available to the real economy, to the productive economy, to families and businesses. And on the other hand, the tightening of the uh, rate cycle is also entirely on the shoulders of families and businesses. So in essence, what we are likely to see is that if the Fed is able to achieve what they deem as a soft landing, and people start to think that things are going to get worse. 
the Fed is going to look at aggregate demand, which is what they do, by the way. They look at aggregate demand. So far, if the government, which weighs between 39 to 50% of the GDP of the economy, is not reducing its demand, a reduction in aggregate demand is only going to come from the private sector, which means a significant slump in profits and a significant slump in consumption. Those are uh, basically the transmission mechanism of this tightening of that of this tightening uh, uh, cycle that we're living, uh, and obviously because I I get excited about the answer, I forgot the first question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was beautiful. It was uh, the question was about the interrelationship uh, between what's happening in longer dated U.S. Treasuries and your view of the future pricing. Uh, on a multiples basis uh, and on uh, re- and and on terms of earnings of U.S. equities. Yes, and coming back to equities, what I think is that this trend of concentration of very large multi mega caps that absorb most of the performance is likely to continue. Is likely to continue because if we look at it from a more uh, let's say extended period of time. What everybody knows is that the Fed is caught between a rock and a hard place. Therefore, policy will continue to be accommodative. And that helps disproportionately the ones that have access to markets and to credit beforehand. Uh, Printing money is never neutral. It always disproportionately benefits the first recipients of money and disproportionately negatively affects the last recipients of money, which are salaries. And uh, uh, and deposit savings. So no wonder the United States, with that allegedly phenomenal growth and with the level of unemployment at uh, very low levels, is seeing negative real wage growth. And on the other hand, you're seeing deposit savings lose their purchasing power and obviously lose in value. So uh, I think that uh, multiple expansion is not likely to come to those sectors that are uh, in the 493 side of Mm. the S&P 500. Actually, what we are seeing is coming back, uh, the multiples that were attached to many of those stocks, because another important thing is happening. Multiple expansion cannot happen when you have buybacks being reduced. The reduction in the amount of buybacks in the S&P 500 is a critical element of multiple compression. So once, as we see that uh, uh, dividend and buyback uh, programs being reduced because companies are suffering, they're not generating as high cash flow as before, etc. It is very likely that the multiples of the uh, per sector will likely contract, but that the multiple relative to the market of the leading companies that continue to absorb most of the of the returns is rising. There's the ETF effect there as well. Because obviously, when the market is rising and people are starting to buy, the marginal buyer is buying mostly indices and ETFs, and inadvertently, it's buying more of the larger of the larger components of the indices. Right. No? Just so, because of the way the weighting takes place. And- exactly. So, if you see on the one hand that about four hundred stocks in the S&P 500 are reducing drastically dividends and buybacks. And on the other hand, when people start to purchase stocks, they're buying mostly in uh, index weighted or ETFs. What happens is that the 493 compress their multiples and the seven expand their multiples. And I think that it's very unlikely, unless there would be a sort of Volcker moment which we're very far away from, um, I think it's very unlikely that we see a drastic change there, i.e. we will continue to see more multiple expansion in the winners and multiple compression in the losers. And US versus uh, EA versus Europe is very simple. United States, high technology exposure and continuing, even though it's reducing, but continued buybacks, Europe, no buybacks and profit warnings. 
So multiple compression in Europe is likely to be more uh, more evident and more evident in the index than in the United States as well. Daniel, one of the things I always enjoy about having you on the show is your outlook is just crystal clear. Uh, no two-handed economists here. I really appreciate the just the clarity of this. And you know, when you're talking about this, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Cantillon effect, this idea that the closer you are to the monetary spigot, uh, the more you benefit from these periods of monetary easing. Uh, and by the way, this is kind of just the price of passive indexation as you see flows into markets taking place in a more passive way. Absolutely, it is. And I don't think that there's anything that the Fed can do about it for a very simple reason. Monetary, monetary easing is like opening the, the floodgates. You cannot expect things not to get wet, no? Um, and, the, and, and ultimately, it's not that they even care too much about this disproportionate uh, uh, concentration of returns in the S&P 500, etc. Uh, if you read what many people at the Federal Reserve talk about, the wealth effect, etc., they basically, they basically think that these are, uh, let's say, acceptable side effects of what is, in essence, a policy that ultimately does help the economy. I, I would disagree with that, but that is the narrative. So, uh, so you cannot change that. You cannot change something that has been driven by monetary policy. No one can argue that the rise of the multi-mega cap giants in technology has been a direct consequence of easy money. No one, and, and, if, and if they right. do, well, obviously, it's easily uh, debunkable, but uh, it's it's impossible to unwind now, no, because uh, the perverse incentive exists. We are already seeing it in the markets. You get a bad jobs report, or not even a bad jobs report, but a lackluster jobs report. People start buying like there's no tomorrow. Why? Because they're expecting easing, and yeah. obviously. That, that, as I said before, monetary policy disproportionately benefits the first recipient of money. And those right. are obviously those, those mega cap giants. Yeah, this is back to the uh, you know 2008 uh, era of uh, bad news is good news, good news is bad news, weirdness that we saw. I can't resist asking you one more long-term question as you think about these uh, markets and where we are right now. One of the most interesting features and probably uh, the most durable in terms of my career watching markets. Uh, if you go back to 1981, probably before most of our viewers were born, you saw 10-year Treasury yields peak out at around 16%. That has gone down, obviously, along a 40-year curve uh, down to uh, whatever it was, uh, I guess, uh, call it uh, call it March uh, or April, whenever the low was, maybe July of 2020, down to about 50 basis points now. Obviously, a significant snapback effect, 4653 right now on 10-year yields. Uh, what is the implication for this rise off the bottom? I mean, it's literally been a, a, a generational or multi-generational period where we've seen this massive bull market in U.S. Treasuries, uh, the subsequent decline in yields. And now, as you point out, Daniel, there's this significant debt bubble and you have rates rising. I mean, this is a uh, an intergenerational shift. It is. And we've had, as you very well pointed out, uh, two generations of traders that have seen nothing but rate cuts and monetary easing and monetary easing in, uh, you know, exponentially increasing, no? To, to move the needle. So what are the implications of this? Is that the 60-40 portfolio is gone, in, my, in a nutshell. The 60-40 portfolio will not work because the correlation bec between bonds and equities is so aggressive because of monetary policy, obviously, that when uh, when rates are rising and uh, the economy is slowing down, bonds don't protect you, and when, uh, sovereign bonds in particular. And in the uh, in periods of exuberance, that's when, obviously, because you have negative real rates, when bonds and equities move, by expanding multiples, bonds become more expensive and uh, equities uh, see multiple expansion. No? So I think that basically that's the problem. The problem right now is that there is a multi-generation view of what would be the ideal portfolio that uh, is being destroyed 
by years of uh, aggressive monetary policy. That's, and that, to me, is the, is the biggest problem. 2023 was supposed to be the year of bonds. Obviously, it isn't. High yield bonds are doing adequately, but that's it, basically. Mm-hmm. And that obviously creates very significant shifts in the way, will probably create very significant shifts in the way that people perceive risk. I think that yeah. uh, y- many people are starting to think, and not on, and not incorrectly, probably that there is less risk in uh, in a in a in a uh, in an alphabet stock or something like that than in the ten-year bond mm. of Italy, for example. Yeah, You're probably right yeah. there. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just based on price performance that we've seen in the market. Listen, let me. Uh, pivot here just a little bit because this is part and parcel of everything we've been talking about which is where we are right now with inflation i want to point specifically to a conversation with alex gurevich uh, and harry melandry on the real vision essential platform out today maybe we could take a look at that clip many people say well inflation came down sharply from like whatever nine percent to three or four percent because of just unwind of those supply chain disruptions it means nothing in terms of actually taming core inflation. That's mm-hmm. the inflation camp says. But to that, I will answer just as we saw that it does not matter for what reason inflation came up in 2021. It's not going to matter for what reason it came down in 2022. It will create a secondary disinflationary effect. When the real rate is going to go from, and it already went, from negative 9% to positive 2.5%, that will have effects, which not only we don't see yet, we could not possibly see yet. That's why I'm kind of totally flabbergasted. Even Powell talks about this. And when I honestly, when I hear people talk about economy resilience to interest rates, I think I'm in a house of lunatics. Because when people say things like economy withstood the rising of interest rates, I'm like, what planet I'm on? Because we don't know. It's not that they did it or didn't. How can we possibly know? That has not happened yet. Like Powell, even in his last speech, he talked about raising interest rates by 75 basis points in first half of 2022. So they, yes, they raised interest rates to 3% when inflation was 9%. So they contracted real interest rates from negative 9% to negative 6% in a huge hurry. How is it supposed to be crush the economy if you still have negative real interest rates? They only became positive a few months ago. Daniel, Eric Skrovich right there on the causes and effects of inflation. Any thoughts? I think Alex is absolutely right. The idea that we know how the rate hike process is going to play out is ludicrous. It makes absolutely no sense. We have no idea of what the rate hike process will damage because we don't know the lag effect. We have no idea whatsoever of what is going to be the ability of the real economy to accept those higher rates. And uh, being way too optimistic, way too early about uh, having the ability to uh, sort out a process of interest rate hikes without breaking anything makes no sense. I think that monetary aggregates tell us a lot about that, in fact, and they're plummeting. All right, we got lots of questions coming in from our viewers here today. Uh, since we're running short on time, we're going to do a quick speed round. Apologies for the shortness of the answer. I know Daniel could answer each one of these questions at length, but I just want to get through as many of them as we possibly can. First one comes to us from Trillion X Macro. Daniel, uh, won't you think we are heading into a stagflation rather than a recession, and therefore gold rather than bonds is the anti-fragile asset to hold? Thoughts on gold? I, I completely agree that gold is the anti-fragile asset the if you're looking for decorrelated assets to have in your portfolio you need to have gold not bonds i agree with that okay speed round question number two marty f what signs do you see that money is coming out of the system daniel well follow monetary aggregates they're very very clear unfortunately the united states doesn't publish m3 anymore but follow m2 follow m1 and there are a number of very good analysts out there that make uh, a proxy of m3 as well so follow monetary aggregates they tell you very very clearly and loans and leases that the that you can see uh, published by the fed as well 
Question from Ralph Humphrey. What does Daniel make of the whipsaw action in the U.S. Treasury market, and how is the sovereign debt market in Europe faring? Well, the sovereign market uh, in Europe is broken because it's been uh, disguised by the European Central Bank and continues to be, by the way, because of the anti-fragmentation tool. So uh, I think it's completely different in the United States. The signals that the United States uh, Treasury yield curve show are more accurate than certainly what you can see in the euro area. And certainly the spreads are no indication of the real risk. Bo Nito asks, Daniel, did you see last week's stock action as more of a matter of market turn, institutional influx, or a buyback period reopening? Or is it a bull trap? I, I don't I don't think it's a bull trap. I think it's basically what we mentioned before. Bad news is good news because people expect easing. Uh, buybacks don't drive stocks. They support valuations, but they don't hmm. they don't drive stock prices. Trillion X Macro asks, what do you make of the change in the BOJ monetary policy? Well, they know that inflation is here to stay and they see that the yen is collapsing relative to the US dollar and their little Ponzi scheme of debt regurgitation disappears if uh, the yen uh, loses its uh, sort of reserve of value status. So that's what they're trying to achieve, some inflow of capital into the yen. Almost a reweighting of the balance of terror in Japan. Martin DBVS asks, what about... EM sovereign bonds. Oh, run away. Oh, run away. Run away like there's no tomorrow. They look attractive. <laughs> they look attractive. But remember that the most of emerging economies have a trade and a fiscal deficit, and most of them are going to disguise their problems, as they always do, with a monetary crisis. If you want to look at very specific EM bonds in hard currency, there might be some opportunities. But as an asset class, very, very dangerous. Remember that many of them as well, at least in the indices, many of them, the largest components are state-owned entities or semi-state-owned entities. Right. So careful with those. Daniel, always appreciate that clarity in your response. Uh, Daniel says, don't walk, run away. Melson Babe from YouTube. Daniel, given... What well, exactly what you've identified as a fiscal and monetary policy divergence? Do you have any doubt that Yellen will finance 15% deficit GDP if needed to avoid a recession in a presidential election year? A very good and cynical question from Melson. I don't have any doubt that you will do it. But if we, if you remember what we just talked about, then the crowding out of the private sector and the impact on aggregate demand of the private sector will be even more severe. Mm. This I one comes to us from Boris Jurisic. Uh, hi, Daniel. Do we maybe need to interpret too much into the level of interest rates because we were not used to them over the last 20 years? However, Jim Bianco makes the argument last week that that level was no problem in the 90s. What is the difference today for ordinary people? I bet the answer involves something involving debt. Of course. Uh, the level of debt that we had in the 90s would be today called frugal. Huh? Mm. Uh, it's it's the elevated level of debt, and obviously the elevated level of debt doesn't look so negative now because the wall of maturities is coming mostly in 2024 and 2025. I agree with Jim that the, that it's not going to be a monster disaster, which I think is what he tries to say. But, uh, but the risk of stagflation that one of our viewers was mentioning is much more important. Yeah, thanks for the question, Boris. I've been doing this so long, I'm getting clairvoyant. Uh, here's the last one. It comes to us from Ralph Humphrey. I'll take a shot in the dark. Does Daniel have an opinion on crude oil? Talking about aggregate demand. Oh, I do. And I think be very, very aware of crude oil. Because if you can see anything out of the price action, is that monetary contraction and the real economy slowdown are much more important than geopolitical risk. So uh, you have a flaw created by that geopolitical risk. But look at the price action since the since the uh, since the beginning of the attack on Israel, and what uh, what it tells us is that things are not nice in uh, the aggregate demand side. Daniel, amazing show! You are a man who's not afraid to take a stand. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us. 
it's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Pleasure for me too. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. We'll be back tomorrow. In the meantime, check out Real Vision where we share the knowledge and tools for your financial success. Have a great afternoon, everybody. People are going to lose their minds. This is a moment in history unlike anything humanity's gone through. It's a very different world for humans to come. Take a step back and see the broad picture, which is the way all these technologies are interlinked. Because this is all about exponentiality and humans can't think in exponential terms. How consequential do you want to say machine intelligence is? It's almost certainly as consequential as writing. How long did writing take to disseminate through the human population? You know, hundreds, thousands of years. And we're dealing with it now on a scale of months. But in this kind of world, you're compounding 100% growth every year and the numbers become astronomical. AI is going to spot patterns in the world that were just completely invisible to us. Even if you think that the AI and the robots are your demise, you might as well bloody invest in them and make some money out of it. If not, you're just going to be angry man shaking your fists at the clouds.